God, today, give us eyes to see and ears to hear. God, as you challenge our thoughts and our hearts, I pray that we would respond to you with a yes. In your name we pray, amen. I wanted to start today by telling you about my first real job. My first real job was at a place called Pizza Mill. This is, I have a picture. This is not the actual place, I don't think. But it was my first real job. When I say my first real job, what I mean is I got a paycheck. My parents made me always work, but they didn't give me money. They just gave me a place to live. Um... But it was my first real job. I made pizzas, and I also delivered pizzas. I would get in my car, 1960, oh, I should have brought a picture of this. I didn't. 1966 Chevy. I would get in my car, and I would deliver pizza. Pizza was the only food that could be, or that was delivered in my town. It was only pizza. But today... You can get any kind of food delivered to your house. All kinds of food delivered. I looked up some statistics about food delivery just because I was curious. Uber Eats. Unfortunately, I know (laughs) Uber Eats. Uber Eats has 66 million users. 66 million users. Also, quick time out, if someone's having trouble with the translation near them, maybe get a different one because maybe it's not working. So you can, if you see someone punching buttons, maybe you can help. <laughs> also, Uber Eats. Beleza. Suave na nave. Uber Eats is also in 6,000 different cities around the world. They deliver 6,000 different cities around the world. And they support, like they deliver for 600,000 restaurants. 600,000. That's just Uber Eats. Like there's other places. Uh, iFood, uh, in the U.S., they have one called DoorDash, which is really big. Um, food delivery companies have 750 million users around the world. 750 million users order food on their phone. Somebody goes and picks it up and brings it to their door. Like... And the food delivery business has grown substantially since COVID. Like now even, I never had used Uber Eats in my whole life until COVID. (laughs) Now I've unfortunately used it too many times, Uber Eats. If you ask someone, what is the most famous miracle that Jesus performed? People would probably have different ones that they might say is the most famous. But many people would choose the feeding of the 5,000. Like the ultimate, the primera Uber Eats was Jesus. Right? Like he delivered. He fed 5,000 and most scholars would say that it was probably closer to 9,000 because they only actually counted the men. So it's, so he fed a lot of people. And what I want to do for just a moment, just because I'm a visual person and it helps me, I thought it might help you. I want us to take three minutes and just watch a depiction of Jesus feeding the 5,000. I think it takes three minutes. Okay, so let's watch. When 
when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish. They answered. Bring them here to me, he said. and he directed the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about five thousand men, besides women and children. I think for me, my imagination makes me think, what would it be like to be there on that day? Like, did you hear what the disciples were saying? Jesus, these people are hungry. We have no food. Send them away. That's what just, I mean, they were being polite. But I think in their mind, they were thinking, Jesus, get these people out of here. We got to go get some food. Like, if you read the Bible... It's not true of every single time, but almost every time the disciples are mentioned in the Bible, it says something about food. They're going to go find food. They want food. They're hungry. They're always wanting food. And I just think if I was there, I would be the same. Jesus. There's lots of people. They've been following you around, hearing you teach, seeing you do miracles everyone's hungry get them out of here so we can go get some food but then at the end it says everyone ate and they were all satisfied not just a few of them but all of them all of them ate and they were satisfied what's interesting that comes that was word for word from the NIV version in English from Matthew chapter 14, verses 14 through 21. 
But then the very next chapter, Matthew chapter 15, very next chapter. So if you have a traditional Bible with paper and you turn, it's probably on the very next page. If you're using your phone, it's just like probably right below. But Matthew chapter 15 is another story. Another story about Jesus feeding people. This is what it says, starting in verse 32. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. I do not want to send them away hungry or they may collapse on the way. His disciples answered, Where could we get enough bread in this remote place for such a crowd? How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Seven, they replied, and a few small fish. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground. Then he took the seven loaves and the fish, and when they had given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples, and they turned and went to give them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. Afterward, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was 4,000 men besides women and children. So, first question for the day. Why do we need two of the same miracle right back to back? Like, why? Doesn't, doesn't it seem a little strange? Let's be honest. Doesn't it seem strange that you have one story, Jesus feeds 5,000 people plus the women and children, and then the very next story, he does it again. But this time it's 4,000 plus women and children. Why? Like there has to be a reason why. It's not just because he was promoting Uber Eats. Like there has to be a reason why. There is a reason why, and the reason is location matters. Location matters. If you look in Matthew chapter 15, verse 21, okay, it's right after he just fed the 5,000. It says, leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. So he fed the 5,000. Him and his disciples took a little bit of a trip, went and did some things there. And then, if you read fifth, chapter 15, verse 29, it says, Jesus left there and went along the Sea of Galilee. Then he went up on the mountainside and sat down. So, I want to, just so we're all understanding on the same page, show this picture. So, the first time Jesus feeds the 5,000, you see, this is the green star. After they left there, it's not on the map, but they traveled, you know, it said Tyre and Sidon. It's actually above. It's not on this map. So they traveled there. When they left there, they came down on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and they came here. And then Jesus feeds 4,000. Why? Why? Like, it's a good, you should be asking yourself why, because it actually matters a lot. Why? Like, usually we read the stories, especially the miracles, and we're like, yay, Jesus fed 5,000. Yay, Jesus fed 4,000. Why? You need to understand why. It's important to understand why. On one side, the top green star, that was Jewish people. That was God's people. That was God's chosen people. And those people on that side, they were wanting to learn from Jesus. They wanted to know more about Jesus. People were hungry. Jesus has compassion on them. Jesus performs a miracle, and everyone was satisfied. 
Then he comes down to the lower green star. These are not Jewish people. These people are not God's people and they are considered unclean. Like Jewish people, they don't want to be near them. They don't want to talk to them. But these people, they wanted to learn from Jesus. These people were hungry. These people, Jesus had compassion on them just like the others. Jesus does a miracle and all of the people eat and are satisfied. Jesus gives the same miracle to both groups of people. God's chosen people, they get to eat and are satisfied. The unclean people, they get to eat and are satisfied. Both groups eat and are satisfied. One in a Jewish environment, one in a non-Jewish environment. But when Jesus traveled to the place of Sidon, which is not on the map, when they decide to return to the Sea of Galilee, they could have gone to the place where they were most comfortable or where they already knew. But the Gospel took Jesus and the disciples to unexpected places. Like they would have never... I'm, I'm just guessing. It doesn't say this, but I'm guessing the disciples as they're traveling down here, they're thinking, Jesus, where are we going? Why are we going to this place? Because this is, these are not our people. Why are we going there? A few questions for you and for me today. You have to understand that comfort and convenience, they are not part of the fruit of the Spirit. Okay? So if you read in the Bible, it says the fruit of the Spirit is, and it starts listing some things, love, joy, peace, patience. You know what's not on the list? Comfort. You know what's not on the list? Convenience. Those things are not part of the fruit of the Spirit. And if you and I are not careful, we, get, we like being comfortable. Like that's, we think that we should be comfortable. Like, my parents told me, like, I'm old, so when TV was invented, there was no such thing as a remote. But my parents still wanted convenience, so they had children, so that the children could go turn the channel on the TV. I was the remote. We want convenience. We want comfort. But the gospel is not about comfort and convenience. So, how does God want to use you? How does God want to use you? Where does God want to use you? Like He may be leading you to unexpected places that make you uncomfortable. If we're not careful, we look for the easy way. We want easy. We want convenience. We want comfort. <clears throat> Remember, he feeds the 5,000. Now they're hanging out with the unclean people in the south part. And this is what it says in Matthew 15, verse 33. His disciples answered, Where could we get enough bread in this remote place for such a crowd? Am I the only one that finds this funny and strange? They had just, we don't know exactly how long it's been, but it wasn't a long time. They had just seen Jesus feed 5,000 people, plus women and children, so there's probably nine, ten thousand 10,000 people. They had seen it. Recently. And Jesus says, man, these people are hungry. We should feed them. And they say, where could we get enough food for all of these people? Here's what I think. It doesn't say this. This is just me speculating, guessing. I think they were a little nervous. Like if you're hanging out with Jesus, 
seeing Him do miracles, listening to Him teach. I think you might be a little nervous too. What's He going to do? And, like, how does it work? Maybe He only gets one chance to feed people with fish and bread, so I don't know, can He do it twice? So they're like, should we ask Him again? I, like, what should we do? I think they were learning. They were just slow learners, like me. They were learning. Because remember the first time they said, Jesus, send the people away. Tell them to go get food somewhere else. The second time they ask, I think cautiously, Jesus, where can we get enough food for all these people? Like I think they're saying, Jesus, are you going to do that thing again? And they already knew. They already knew how much food they had because Jesus asked. Remember, he says, how much do you have? I think we, they said, we have seven pieces of bread and a few fish. So they already knew. Like they had went and scouted out how much. Jesus, we have this much. Can you do it with this much? We've seen you do it before, but can you do it with this much? I think they knew. They knew that they couldn't do it. Like they couldn't on their own feed those people, but Jesus could. But they were just like slowly, cautiously stepping. Jesus, here's seven. Seven fish. What can you do with this? And God wants to use you just like He used the disciples. He put the fish and the bread back into the disciples' hands and let them distribute the miracle. Like he, They distributed the food. God wants you to use you to deliver His love, to deliver His grace, to deliver His mercy. We bring what we have. We put it in the hands of Jesus. And then Jesus does only what Jesus can do. It's not your job to do the miracle. It's not your job to do anything except here's God's grace, here's God's mercy, here's God's love. I guess that's the only thing that you have to do. But that requires living your life like this, not like this. Most of us live our life like this. This is mine. And we do it even with the gospel. We do it with Je Jesus is mine. Don't touch my Jesus. Like we, we all act like we're three years old. Don't touch my Jesus. This is my Jesus. But then Jesus puts it back in the disciples' hands. Like Jesus, think about it for just a moment. Jesus could have delivered the food any way he wanted, right? If he can multiply bread and fish, couldn't he deliver the food any way he wanted? Like he could have just had these baskets drop down from the sky and they already had the food in it. Or better yet, Jesus could have just made the food appear inside the people's mouth. Like he could have done that. Like they're hanging out and they're talking and it's just like... And they got fish and bread in their mouth. Like he could have done that. But he wanted the disciples to participate and to see what he was doing. So they go, deliver the food, and then remember what it said? They had to go back again and pick up the extra because there's more. Everybody, it says everyone ate and they were satisfied. I think today Jesus is inviting you to participate with him. There's lots of stuff in St. Paulo that he could do on his own. Like he's God and he can do whatever he wants, but he's saying, I want you to participate with me in distributing my love, my grace, and my mercy. The same miracle appears in the book of John. And after the miracle, Jesus is hanging out with his disciples and it says this in John 6, 26. Jesus answered, 
Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Jesus is giving you and me a warning. Be careful. Why are you seeking after me? Just because I can do stuff for you? Be careful. Because God wants to use you to distribute his love, grace, and mercy is not just about what he wants to give you. Yes, he'll give you. He'll, love, he'll give you grace and mercy. But he wants you to give it away as well. What's your motivation? Important question. What is your motivation? Why do you come to church? Why do you go to church online? Why do you read your Bible? Why do you pray? And if the answer to all of those questions is me, 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 I think you're in danger because it is not about you. To get something from Jesus or to follow Jesus, we have to go wherever he leads. If the disciples, remember the map, if the disciples would have said, Jesus, we don't want to go down there, they would have missed out on a whole other miracle. And then in John chapter 6, verse 35, it says this, Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus called to the disciples, give, you give them something. To, they came and said, Jesus, send them away. And he said, no, you give them something to eat. Jesus partnered with the disciples to perform a miracle. And they fed lots of people. So how does God want to use you? How does God want to use me? How does God want to use Sampa Church? Those are important questions. I can't answer all of that for you. I don't know all of the ways. Like, it's a big deal. What happens here? It's a big deal. <clears throat> so, <laughs> what does this mean? Open for delivery and takeout. Like, maybe you think it's just a cool thing that I put on there because... I wanted to talk about Uber Eats or whatever, but I actually have a reason. <clears throat> Sometimes people come to church and they receive something from God and they take it away, right? Like sometimes you do that. You come to church, you receive something from God and you take it away with you and you hopefully do something with it. Hopefully it's not just something you get and you put it in your pocket and that's it. Hopefully you do something with it. So sometimes people come to church and they take away. But sometimes it's important for the church to actually deliver. Like to take grace, mercy, love, to take that somewhere. Do you see the difference between come and get something and you take it away versus I'm going to deliver this to some other place. I think both are important. We need both. It's not just one or the other. Both are important. Where does God want you to deliver his grace and his mercy and his love? Like maybe at your workplace where you work, maybe in your neighborhood, maybe even in your own family. God wants you to deliver his grace and his love and his mercy. Where does God want Sampa Church to deliver grace and mercy? Ultimately, I don't have the answer for that. Like, COVID has really messed lots of things up, right? The club where we used to meet before COVID 
this is like <laughs> bankrupt. Like we can't go there even if we want because nobody knows who owns it. So where, what does that look like? And I don't have all the answers, but I do have a temporary answer. Here's my temporary answer, okay? This is what we're going to do for the moment. As a church, we're going to choose to deliver God's grace and His mercy to a different part of the city. So every other week. So this Sunday, we meet here at IBTE. Next Sunday, we meet online. Okay? On the computer, in your house, on your phone. Then the next week, we're going to come back here to IBTE. And let me explain why. Two reasons why. Number one. We could find some other place to go and rent. Let's just pretend. We could rent the, if you've been at Sample for a long time, we used to meet at a hotel. We could rent the hotel again, and we pay them money. And someone, I don't know who, maybe even someone who doesn't live in Brazil, makes a profit with that money. Or we could come here to IBTE, and we can pay them rent, and the money goes to help Kids like Bruna. Okay? So for, for now, I'm not saying this is where we ultimately end up two years from now, but for now. Every other Sunday, we're going to come here. Every other Sunday, on your computer. Okay? I don't know in the long term what that looks like, but here's what I do know. For some of you, coming here is really far. And it's not very convenient. It wasn't very convenient for the disciples to go to the south part of the Sea of Galilee either. It was not convenient. For some of you, maybe it makes you a little uncomfortable to come to this part of the city. Here's what I know. Comfort and convenience are not part of the fruit of the Spirit. So I'm completely okay with you and me being uncomfortable or inconvenienced because we come here for a while. Because I think it's for the greater good. Does that make sense? I hope. If you have questions before you leave today, talk to me. But for now, we're going to... Here's what happens. What, last thing, I prom. I shouldn't promise and then lie. I'm going to try to make this the last thing. <clears throat> you get a chance to deliver the gospel of Jesus to the center of the city, and that looks like a ton of different things. So when you're driving here, and you smile at someone that no one ever smiles at, that means something. When you wave at someone that no one ever waves at, that means something. Or you can just choose to sit at your house and only think that the gospel is about takeout and you just take it with you to your little comfy house and you just sit there and you love Jesus well in your little house but Jesus has not called us to convenience or to comfort. So if you want to be upset at someone today, be upset at Jesus, not at Bob. Because when you come to this part of the city and you interact with people and you love on people, just looking at someone because nobody ever looks at them, right? Nobody makes eye contact with them because they're scary people. When you look at someone, you can love someone with the love of Jesus just by looking, just by smiling. Or you can take your takeout and go home and be comfortable in your house and you love Jesus but if you remember when people ask Jesus, what is the most important thing? He said two things. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. 
and love your neighbor as yourself. So I'm going to change that just a bit. Love your city. This is part of your city. Let's pray. <clears throat> God, I thank you for today. God, I pray that you would challenge us where we need to be challenged. Convict us where we need to be convicted. Give us grace when we need grace. Give us mercy when we need mercy. But I pray that you would remind us that you want us to participate with you just like the disciples. You want us to deliver your love and your grace and your mercy. So God, my prayer for all of us is that we would live our life by receiving from you freely, but by also giving to others freely. Jesus, I'm sure that the disciples were a little maybe even afraid or unsure of what was going to happen. God, for us, when we're <clears throat> afraid or unsure, <coughs> I pray that you would comfort us. God, I pray that we would ask ourselves, why? Why do we come to church? Why do we pray? Why do we say that we love? <coughs> God, my prayer is that you would teach us to love you more and better so that we could learn how to love each other more and better. And we pray in your holy name. Amen.